This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog-style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics. Dare to sound different. My mother had me sit down at a piano with her, and she played, and I kind of tapped on the keys a little bit, and um, that's my first introduction to it. And I started taking lessons because the little girl across the street was taking piano lessons. And I found a good teacher, a really wonderful teacher named Ruth Newman in Bidger, California. And Ruth allowed me to read music, but she said, told my mother, let's, let's not take the magic out of it for him. So in other words, let, allowed me to play by ear as well. Um, so there was that. There was also uh, uh, my sister, who's nine years older than I am, was listening to Elvis Presley. This is a few years later. And uh, I got drawn, really drawn into music at that point. But the, the piano has always been a really kind of a magical and a, a instrument for me and a refuge, honestly. Yeah, I mean, it is an incredible instrument. And in many different contexts, many different styles but my favorite and i'm sure many people listening it will be their favorite as well the kind of style that you play i mean well how would you characterize the way that you play what what, what genres because i mean little feet combines a few um and and you've of course worked with many different artists but how would you say that you play the piano if you could characterize it <laughs> I, Tom, I don't really know uh, uh you know i love the new orleans stuff uh, that that filters into uh, professor Longhair. Uh, uh, through Josh Mac Rabinac, you know, Dr. John. Um, oh, I was, I was trying to figure out a few days ago, you know, the question you had about what are your favorite five songs or albums? And I thought, boy, this, this is so, uh, it's unfair in the sense that, um, I mean, it's a great question, but it's unfair in that it's hard to, uh, you know, figure out one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Things. So I, I threw together a list, but it's kind of like the way I play piano. I mean, I, I just wrote something with a, a guy, a friend of mine named Paul Muldoon, who's a, uh, a Pulitzer Prize winning poet. And uh, it was kind of a ragtime piano thing, but then it would more, I mor morphed it into more of a jazz a jazz element that was totally divorced from the, the ragtime thing. But in the context of that, I would, I would start to shift the boundaries. It's almost like if you're scoring something. So I guess it's taken me a while to tell you this, but my, my sense of piano is, is through uh, uh, the, uh, the visual a lot of times. I'll take a visual like when I was a kid, my parents would take me down to the beach in, in Ventura on the coast. And, and I, I'd come back later that day and I tried to replicate on the piano what I saw, what I heard, the smell of the sea, the sound of the seagulls, the crashing of the waves. Try to replicate that on the piano. So, so that's what I meant about the, the, the notion of the piano being a refuge for me. I mean, I'm sitting right next to a mm -hmm. piano here. And that piano was, uh, was one that I played on a, the first couple of Emmy Lou Harris records, Boulder to Birmingham and one other. Wow. Yeah, so uh, uh, that's incredible. Just, touch this is how I can always r r roll over there. If I need to explain something in, in music, I'll, I'll, I'll whip over there and play, a, play a something. So. Wow, yeah, that that would be that would be awesome. I mean, in terms of the way that you learned piano, did you learn kind of like classically, learning to read, and and if so, do you still use that side of it? Because I know like there have been people who've learned classically and then kind of as as they've played 
more rock and roll and genres, you know, even jazz. They, they don't read anymore. What I started off with, right? <laughs> I started off with this and then I have this out because I'm, I'm contemplating writing about all this stuff. And uh, oh, that would be great. The first piece I did. And it was uh, CDE. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then uh, over here's the left hand, CBA. I found the left hand to be very, rather exotic, you know, just uh, uh, magical, maybe, in that it, it already, I was starting to shift another part of my brain to deal with the left hand. When did you think that you wanted to, you know, be a musician professionally and pursue that in your career? I literally went in there, Tom, to audition to play drums. <laughs> And they had a piano up against the wall, and they said, "Hey, uh, I mean, when I started playing, I like I was literally standing at the piano, just sort of nonchalantly playing like I was for you." And they go, "Wait a minute, do you play the you play the piano?" I go, "Yeah, I guess." You know, and they go, "Hey, man, forget this band. Don't worry about playing drums. We're gonna well, you're gonna play with the debonairs." We're, we got a, a house down the street. Uh, we've got all the gear you want, and uh, it's Garage Band. We'll be playing gigs. So at age 15, that's when I joined my band, and I joined it primarily because Ruth passed away, and I was just so upset and and lost, really. That it was my parents' way of saying, "Let's try and get the kid back into life again." And uh, I've been in bands ever since. I'm 72 now, so. Yeah, yeah, and and. <laughs> all sorts of bands played with all sorts of people and Little Feet, as I say, you know, undoubtedly one of the best bands uh, of all time. Uh, but I'm interested and sorry for skipping ahead because I want to hear about, well, I want to give you sufficient time to go through those five. So was it five songs that you selected or five artists? Yeah, or albums? Let's go or we, we can go, you know, whatever you want to do. So the genesis of uh, Little Feet, for those people that don't know, um, and, you know, just based on what I've read and heard, seems pretty interesting. How did the band actually come about? Well, the band came about uh, on a couple levels. It was almost like a Stephen King novel, you know, where people are disparate personalities and places, and they all start to intervene, and they, they wind up in Hollywood <laughs> somehow. Um, I said I would never live in Los Angeles. I wound up living there for 33 years. Um, Lowell George was asked by Frank Zappa, uh, based on Willem, a song he wrote, to maybe form his own band. So, and I, during that time period, I was listening to a, a, an album by Uncle Me, or by Frank Zappa and the Mothers, called Uncle Beat. And Lowell was on that album. I don't actually think he was in the band, but he's on the record. And... So I was up in uh, Northern California contemplating joining a band up there. As I said, I wanted to get as far away from LA as I could. When I heard Uncle Mean, I go, God, that's the kind of music I want to play. So <laughs> damn it, I got to go to Los Angeles. Um, I called up a, a, a record company, uh, it was Warner Brothers. And uh, Frank Zappa had two labels. One was Straight and the other was Bizarre. I called Bizarre. And uh, as in B-I-Z-Z-A-R-E. And uh, the, not the first time, but the second, they, they initially introduced me to somebody else. And then they, I said, well, that's not going to work out. This guy already plays keyboards. And it was a cool guy. Was a, uh, in a band called Eureka. Um, I, kinda, and I'm, I'm, I cannot remember his name, and I should. Um, but anyway, I called back to Warner Bros. And they said, well, there's this guy, Lowell George, because I wanted to meet Frank Zappa. They go, well, Frank's going to Europe, but we can turn you on to Lowell George, and maybe when Frank gets back, you'll be able to meet him, or whatever. We'll, we'll see about that later. Uh, Richie Hayward was in a group called the Fraternity of Man. Richie Hayward was our drummer. Um, I would direct people to BillPayneCreative.com to read an essay I wrote on Richie, which is about 10,000 words. 
and get an idea who he was. He passed away some years ago. Um, so Richie came in from, and the fraternity of men had Don't Bogart That Joint. And there was a movie with Jack Nicholson and um, Peter Fonda, uh, that motorcycle movie, uh, a really famous film. I'm, I'm at a loss to tell you what it is. Uh, at any rate, um, then we spent about a year searching for a bass player, literally. And so we went through about 11, 12 bass players, one of whom was was Paul Barrere. And <laughs> Paul goes, Lowell, I, I, I play guitar. You know, I don't play bass. He goes, well, it's two less strings. <laughs> so that was Lowell's, uh, Lowell's old deal. Two less strings, good luck. And then I set a chart in front of him called Dance of the Nubile Virgin Slaves, which Stravinsky himself probably couldn't have read. And uh, <laughs> 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 so play this. And uh so Paul did not make it, but two years later, we brought him into the band. So it's like everything else, Little Feet was very circuitous, um, riding by the seat of your pants. Um, I, when I first showed up at Lowell's house for our first meeting, there was this young, beautiful girl, uh, blonde hair, listening, uh, cross-legged, listening to Eric Satie. And the door was wide open. It was hot because it was summer. Just, oh, you must be Bill. Lowell's expecting you. I go, oh, oh is, he, is he around? Is he, oh, he'll be back in four hours. I go, four hours? What does he do when he's not expecting you? So uh, at any rate, yeah, I walked into the house and he had his sitar on the back wall. Uh, no, uh, yeah, back wall to the right. On the very back wall, he had a, a samurai sword. In his library, he had books by... Uh, was, I got one over here someplace. It's a poetry. Oh, there it is, Carl Sandberg. So, uh, but he also had Hal by uh, Ginsburg, Alan Ginsburg. Uh, he had a record collection with Ohm, John Coltrane. He had Blues by Chester Burnett, Alan Wolf, you know, and, uh, Muddy Waters. Um, a very eclectic guy. And by the time he showed up, I sort of felt like I kind of knew him. <laughs> and there's a, there's always, but there's this description that uh, people have written about the first time Castro met um, um, Che Guevara, and that they had, the first time they met, they were able to talk about everything under the sun and moon. And that's the way it was for Law and I too. We just, we just hit it off. And yet, I didn't want to. I wasn't about to join a band with him. I just wanted, I still wanted to meet Frank. So about a month, month and a half later, when I finally did meet Frank, um, it was, uh, I, I was already embedded with Little Feet. So that's, and then Frank helped us get, get our band started. So that's a long winded way to say what we did and how we did it. Well, I mean, it's it's a really interesting story and and a lot of people, kind of wonder the exact ins and outs of it particularly obviously with you know a name like frank zappa yeah. kind of being a part of that story but and again you know apologies for kind of skipping ahead a bit here uh yeah. <clears throat> when would you say that you hit your stride in terms of albums and you know do you think things like dixie chicken were like the best that you you know, the best that you ever recorded? Um, or, or do you look back at things that you did later on, um, you know, equally fondly or, or more fondly? You know, what's the phrase? It's like home movies, right? You know, you sit there and you, you listen, you see footage of the band or I see footage of what we did. Um, I have a fun place for a lot of it. Not so fun for other things, but it's mainly about personalities, right? So, um, musically, the journey has been been really great, and the band uh, sitting here in 2021, we're going to be recording again. We're going to do uh, a project next year, which uh, um, involves waiting for Columbus, I believe, and. Uh, 
we've got a bunch of material written that, that will go probably after that. Uh, so there's a lot of plans for Little Feet still. And people would think, well, how is it Little Feet without Lowell George, without Paul Brer, without Richie Hayward, without, 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 without? And we go back to the beginning. <clears throat> Lowell and I, when we first put the band together, we, we thought Little Feet ought to be free enough to be able to, if we want a horn section, let's hire a horn section. If we want to bring in another guitar player, let's do that. If we want more keyboards, let's let's see what we want to. How how do we want to augment the band, augment the sound? What do we need to stick to any one style of music, or can we just do what we like to do, which is be influenced by things and bring those influences either whole or or chopped into little pieces and spread them throughout the salad? How do we want to do this? And we both agreed that the the best uh, avenue for Little Feet and for us to keep our interests going and also just to see how this thing would grow, what what, what would happen, would be to keep it uh, freestyle. Um, that said, Richie Hayward was in the band until he passed away. Paul Barrera was with us since 1972. We still have Sam Clayton and Kenny Gradney playing bass and, and uh, Congas with us. Kenny's on bass. Uh, they were both with... Uh, Oh man, uh, what was it? The, the uh, well, we brought Clayton in for the first gig over in Hawaii at the Crater Festival, but they were with Delaney and Bonnie before that. So Delaney and Bonnie had Eric Clapton. I mean, it had all mm. these incredible people in it. And um, one of the guys from SIR, which is Studio Instrument Rentals, which I think they might have in London, if they have them everywhere else. Uh, Ken uh, brought Kenny in for us to, to listen to. And I did, man, Kenny just like sat down, and played everything I threw at him. And I went, you got the gig. <laughs> he still has the gig. <laughs> um, so it's a, a little feat is, is, when I say little feat is bigger than any of us, that's, that's what I mean. It, I mean, when we sit down, if I sit down to play Happy Birthday, not everybody's going to know it's me, but probably a few people would. Oh, that's the way Bill plays, you know, that kind of stuff. Little Feet has a sound. And uh, that sound yeah. is intact. It, it grows. It, it comes back in on itself. It morphs. But it still, it still sounds like Little Feet. And it's a, I would have never dreamt. I mean, I always hoped when I was a young younger guy like I joined Little Feet in 1969 when I was uh, uh, 20 years old that I, I I really didn't have a clue that I'd be playing in Little Feet when I was 72. Um, <laughs> That's incredible. But I'm playing with the Doobie Brothers. I'm heading over to France pretty soon to work with Eddie Mitchell on a project. W um, will you be playing live with Little Feet in the future? Oh yeah. Yeah, we will. In fact, we're going to be, uh, we're working up a little uh, tour in November. Do your brothers go out in late August, uh, September, October. We'll do some playing down in Nashville in, uh, where is it? Uh, September. I've got a nine day break. So I'll join Little Feet. But yeah, once I leave home to start the Doobie Brothers, which is late July, even though the tour is in late August, I don't really get home until October 30th. I'll go wow. right out. To Little Feet. So it's, is that uh, the big reunion tour? Yes, yeah, with Michael McDonald and all that. It's going to be fun. That's uh, that is going to be cool. It's really really cool. So and what what's it? Um, at, presumably, presumably that would have got postponed due to the pandemic. So had you already kind of rehearsed everything before? We had. We were we were in Las Vegas, and uh, it was in February, and Tommy got sick, and we we. Hung out for a little while, see if he'd get better. Didn't. So we went home, and then uh, I went off to Philadelphia to play with the New Orleans Suspects with Fred Tack and with John Grove from New Orleans. And the Suspects are from New Orleans, obviously. And um, yeah, that was on March 7th, I believe. Got home around maybe so was it the 7th or 8th. Got home, and on the 10th or 11th, the NBA, the National Basketball Association, shut their doors. And I went, oh, man, this is serious. 
Yeah. This is this is it. Be so time till the God, I haven't been anywhere uh, in fourteen months. I mean, I've gone up to town and stuff, but I mean, I haven't really, I haven't traveled anywhere. So my first flight will be to uh, Paris, uh, in about two two and a half weeks, something like that. Wow. And and yeah. what, what are you doing over there? You said you were working with. Well, it's a, it's a, a wonderful singer named Eddie Mitchell. And I worked with Eddie uh, on a record in Los Angeles quite a few years ago now, it seems. But that project was was supposed to happen as well. And it got, it got I mean, a lot of stuff got canceled. Little Feet was going to tour. I was going to go to the south of France. Uh, I was going to go to Italy just to, with my wife to vacation, go to La Scala. We actually bought tickets for that. and. Uh, yeah, so the world yeah. shut down, and, and I learned how to record here at the house. I learned a lot of things during that pandemic. Um, yeah, well, it's the right way to approach it if you can. I mean, some people have not been able to be creative and be productive, but yeah. if you can, it, it feels like it was the best thing to do uh, with the time. Well, we were all caught in, well, not all of us, but a lot of us were caught in that thing where where people could not create some of it, most of it's up here, right? You just sit there. Yeah. And go, what am I going to do today? I want to do everything. Oh, I don't feel like doing nothing. So you kind of go through that, that malaise, right? Because nobody knew where the world was headed uh, at that time. We have a it better idea sense of purpose. That's that, that's the thing. Right. It removes that sense of motivation for some people. So I can see that, but. I can too, but I. If you get too you, philosophical, you can't really do anything. And that applies pandemic or no pandemic so that's right so you had you never recorded from home before not not really i, I had buzz it's in the system all kinds of stuff so i i just systematically tore things down put them back together and then well there's the end of the buzz good now what do i do and then i finally bought a piece of gear that aligned everything computer wise and keyboard wise to one another i bought some mics from um Roswell, let's see. These people are wonderful, I gotta say. Like, do a little advertisement for them just because I think they're great. Yeah, Roswell, I got these mini K47s. And then I bought the, the bigger one, which is in back of me. Um, it's, it's has a little lid over it. But I, so I can sing vocals here at the house. I, I used to do everything kind of you know, piecemeal. I wrote 20 songs with Robert Hunter. And during the course of that, I learned really not how to record, but just to uh, to put songs into a, a, a demo fashion. But they didn't sound real good. The stuff I work on now sounds really good. And, um, but that was over well over a year after Robert passed away. So well, but you just have to, in, in this world, you just have to when things happen, you have to uh, to adjust the best you can. And, you know, some people have talked to me, Tom, about the idea of, well, why would you want to write a song? This is before the pandemic. Why would you want to write a song? Where do you, where do you put it? I said, well, I don't really care where it goes. I mean, I want it to, to be heard. But I said, I write songs because I want, I want to demonstrate to people that still like what I do, that I'm capable of carrying on a, and, and expanding on the conversation. Uh, I have something to offer, in other words. So it's about looking forward and not looking back. And, and also, I mean, I guess to a large part, you're doing it to express yourself. And uh, I mean, you've already earned, you've earned the, the audience. So there are going to be people who pay attention. So express yeah. yourself and enjoy yourself as well. Well, that's it, and not a lot of people have heard the uh, the Robert Hunter stuff. So um, we are now with management uh, a management company called Vector, which is Ken Levitan in Nashville. These guys are really, really good, and uh, I think they're going to breathe new life into Little Feet in a business fashion. Which, uh, if you're in the business of making music, you want to have people that are capable of that that part of the deal which is the handshake mm. uh, spearhead your music getting out there it's uh really I, crucial 
It is. And I, I also learned during the pandemic that I could probably survive with, with or without playing music. Uh, I don't mean playing music, but, but touring necessarily. But I like to tour. I love the interaction of being on stage, the audience. Um, I mean, it's just what I've done all my life. And I, and I love the Doobie Brothers. I, I've known those guys a long, long time. So now we have Scott and this, and for Little Feet, we have Scott Sherrard on guitar, Tony Le, uh, Leone. Leone on uh, uh, drums. Tony played with uh, Chris Robinson in the Brotherhood. And he played with Levon Helm when Levon wasn't playing. Wow. Brown. Played with Phil Lesh. I played with Phil Lesh. Uh, played with Larry Campbell, another dear friend. Uh, Scott Sherrard, I met him on a tour of the Doobie Brothers when he was the, the musical director for Greg Allman. And wow. uh, so he's got some great chops that he brings to the table. Uh, we saw Fred Tackett, Kenny Gradney, uh, Sam Clayton, myself. So we have a horn section that has played with everybody. Uh, uh, in fact, somebody, John Hall, who's with a band called Orleans. Oh, yeah. They're Still, amazing. Yeah, amazing. John just sent me a track for a Christmas album to play on. And he, he did, it's not on this song, but another one he sent me. They had uh, uh, one of our horn players, uh, uh, Jay Collins, playing on it. So that was cool. So it's just a, a bunch of musicians. A lot of people are on the East Coast. I live in Montana. And Fred, and Sam, and Kenny are in uh, L.A. So we're spread out to all four corners of the world. Well, not the four corners of the world, but we are the two corners plus the, <laughs> the mountains in the United States. Um, so that's the, the news there. Uh, I mean, there's a huge there's a huge amount of stuff that you've got going on, and I mean, I'd be, I'd be very excited to see both Doobie Brothers and Little Feet when when you're back on the road. Now, I wanted to ask about as this is the greatest music of all time podcast. Did you have uh, five tunes or five artists? And if if you didn't, th th there's no no problem. No, but I, I just do. wanted to, I just wanted to check uh, because if you've prepared them, I, I definitely want to hear them. Yeah, I have. I, I have. Um, let's. I, I'll put them in order. I guess I, they're, they're relatively in order. Bob Dylan, nineteen sixty-five, bring it all back home. That's the album, right? And that album has, amongst many tunes, it has uh, a subterranean homesick blues. It's all right, Ma. Maggie's farm. Gates of Eden. Tambourine man. It's all over now, baby blue, and just incredible. I mean, that's on one record. I found out that Steve Boone and John Sebastian both were with the Love and Spoonful. Mm. They both played bass on this record. All right. And I bring it up because Steve Boone, when we when Little Feet did Feast Don't Fail Me Now, Steve Boone was the guy that owned the studio in Baltimore that we we went to record in. That that studio was on a barge which later, later sunk. And <laughs> fortunately wow. we got all of our tapes out of there. <laughs> but I, I said, God, all this time I, I had no idea that Steve Boone was involved in that record. It, what what uh, what album was that his second, third? It had to be about his third or fourth album, I think. It's when he went electric and everybody flipped out. Yeah, I mean, I it's I, a fantastic I, I, album, but or more or less every album from the '60s done by yeah. Dylan was they're incredible, unbelievable. Yeah, I was when I was out with Phil Lesh, uh, D Dylan was playing as well, and he came up to me. He goes, uh, "I wanted to meet my son," so I was in a line of people. He goes, "Hey, Billy, you remember the bottom line?" I go. I go, God, Bob Dylan knows my name. Um, I go, yeah, Bob. I was like, you were just like, just right off a of center and scared the hell out of me. <laughs> the bottom line was a club in New York. And it was back in the, God, the 70s. I go, how the hell does he remember that? But he remembers a lot. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. He seem, seems like he, he would. That was a very uh, funny impression. <laughs> he just turned 80 uh, yesterday, I guess. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Doug Brinkley, who's a writer, a uh, historian, actually, I believe is writing about Bob um, for a, a book. I hope that, that happens. Um, so a lot of connections. Let's move down to the, the second. A little Richard, slipping and sliding. Mm. Uh, that was for me a, a chance to, to to really get charged up about rock and roll, and it gave me a certain sense of style between him and uh, oh Jerry Lee Lewis had that kind yeah. of style. But Little Richard was just amazing, and the sax player was just incredible. So when there's a do 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 ba ba do 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 ba that sax line, if you listen to uh, on Little Feet, you go, hate to lose your loving. And I do my first piano solo at the end, toward the end of that song. I caught that lick as a tip of the hat to that album, to, or to that song, and to that sax part. Um, yeah, it is an amazing sax part. Now, my son is going to be 39 uh, June 2nd, so next week. When he was a little kid, <laughs> I put on that tune for him just to see what he would do. And he went racing through the house as if I'd given him like 10 <laughs> spoonfuls of sugar or something. <laughs> and I said, I thought I was a little old. I mean, quite a bit older than him. I, was, I don't know how old I was, but I was, I had to be at least nine or 10 or 11. But I, I felt the same way when I heard that music. And I just wanted to see if he did. And so that's the power of music. I mean, it really does. It takes you on a journey. Yeah, absolutely. And especially that type of timeless music. Yes, absolutely. A lot of the stuff I, I, I have is in the 60s, as it turns out. Uh, no surprise you know, there. Really. By design, I, I really thought about this time and I got, gosh, what do I, how do I, because I still listen to stuff that, that I really love, but I, I thought, well, let's, let's stick to the five. So this is one that I, this is jazz now that, uh, uh, from 1966, uh, Wayne Shorter. Now Wayne Shorter was a sax player long before he, or I only knew about Wayne when he was with uh, Weather Report. The band weather mm. and, yeah yeah and uh, amazing band yeah it's incredible absolutely and, um, but this this recording was from 1966 it's called speak no evil and the people play it's a blue note records the herbie hancock is on it i mean just some extraordinary riffs behind uh, the, the melody is being played and herbie's playing all this these different uh, just wonderful voices. Now, I didn't really listen to this album until like a couple of years ago. I really listened to it and it influenced me quite a bit. Uh, the guys that were playing on it were Elvin Jones. Elvin Jones was a, a drummer. He played with, with, with uh, John Coltrane, played mm -hmm. with a lot of people. Uh, Richie Hayward, uh, Richie's sense of playing uh, symbols was also based on Elvin Jones, as well as uh, uh, man. Okay, now another mental gap on who played drums was with, with Jimi Hendrix, uh, Mitch Mitchelson, I think it was. So I wouldn't know <laughs> Hendrix drummer. Anyway, I think it's Mitch Mitchelson. A lot of symbols, symbol work. Mm. So Elvin Jones, Freddie Her Herbert. Ron Carter, who I think I did a session with uh, on a song with Bonnie Raitt, which did, did, get, did, did not get recorded, unfortunately, but I think maybe Ron came in later to do something else. Anyway, I love that album. That's, that's one of my favorites. And from there, the journey will just open up for anybody that takes it, because uh, uh, that's the other thing Law and I used to talk about was, was uh, the connection between things. Mm. So maybe a, maybe you're you're later on in life and you go oh man I really love Eric Clapton which we do too, <laughs> but where did Eric get his impetus to do what he did? 
and that's what... and go back and listen to all of the great blues artists um yeah. yeah i mean to be honest you know that's how i found little feet's music that's because right. uh you know when i was 18 well before 18 i was obsessed with the beatles then 18 i sort of thought oh maybe there's more to elton john than the lion king then you find right. out he's great and then you realize that actually beyond his 70s stuff you know that's just like the tip of the iceberg that's just like the most mainstream stuff and then you end up listening to poco and orleans and uh like obscure people who you know like uh, bill chamblin uh, i was listening to from like his work uh and uh, you know now it's like everything documentaries about the band and yeah. and and eric clapton as you say there was like great documentary about him last year and you end up trying to scour through Howling Wolf and Muddy Waters and all of the people who inspired him. I mean, that it's those musical journeys. That's exactly right. And uh, we, there, are, there is an interconnection between most of us that play music. It's, it's, a, it's a club we would never join on our own, but it's, it is one of the most exclusive clubs there are. I mean, other than, you know, President of the United States or other, you know, uh, any huge political scene, I guess. But yeah, Eric came to one of our, a couple of our shows. <laughs> and I said, hey man, you're just, we're here in New York, you're in New York, now you're up in, uh, you're up in Detroit. What, what are you doing? What's going on? Oh, I wanted my band to hear a proper band. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. <laughs> um, well, I mean, he's right. You always, well, you always hear Little Feet name checked uh, by by people. Well, yeah, and Elton John, uh, Bonnie Ray goes, "You got to, you got to meet Elton John. He loves your music. He loves the way you play piano." And I, I actually, like an idiot, went down to try and meet him. And there were so many people that were at the Universal Amphitheater. <laughs> I went, "I'm never gonna get close to this guy." So I. I didn't do it. Then I was at the Seafull Townhouse in uh, Sydney, Australia, and I ran into uh, God, one of the guys in the band, uh, uh, a guitar player, and Davey. And yeah, Davey yes. <laughs> and he said, said "El wants to say hey." And I go, "Oh, all right." And I went, "I don't think so." So I, I never did say hello to him. Oh, that's, really, that's a shame because he's always know, he's, he's always name checking guy. Little Feet. He even said that his <laughs> yeah, fans yeah. sound like you. I may have, I probably left him a note saying, thank you, I really appreciate it. I just didn't want to disturb him. You know, I just- Yeah, I just, well, that's yeah. a cool attitude to uh, to have, you know, uh, to not be yeah. too, you know, not be too fussed about it either way. But I mean, I'm sure he'd be pretty fussed. He seems like a huge fan of, of yours, that's for sure. He is, and I, I love his stuff too, so it's- uh, a mutual appreciation for sure. Absolutely, yeah, no, it's, it's it's incredible. Uh, number four, Howlin' Wolf, Chester <laughs> Burnett. The record <clears throat> is called Howlin' Wolf. The songs I gravitated to were Backdoor Man, Little Red Rooster, which the Rolling Stones covered. I probably heard that first, and then then heard his version when I was like, okay, wow. Wang Dang Doodle, Spoonful, Shake for Me. It's just a long list of material. And a couple of things. Hubert Sumlin played with Helen Wolf. I've, I'm a photographer as well as a musician. And I got a great photo of Hubert Sumlin on our bus after he'd sat in with us. I think we were in New Jersey or someplace. And what a, just such a great guy. He told us all kinds of stories about Willie Dixon, who was a boxer. He says, well, if you didn't get the song right, Willie won't fight you. <laughs> I go, oh, that couldn't have been too good. Well, a, a couple of years later, we did a, uh, it was for John Lee Hooker, right? And it was a tribute to John Lee, who's still alive. About two or three months later, I played on one of John Lee's records, right? Uh, which he was kind enough to sign for me. And I was just, I, it was wonderful. But at the rehearsal, at Madison Square Garden, it was Richie Hayward on drums, Paul Barrera from Little Feet, and myself. We had George Porter on bass uh, from New Orleans. And George was pretty much the musical director. 
But the people we were backing up were were uh, Greg Allman, Johnny Winter, Joe Cocker, and Willie Dixon. Wow. And Willie Dixon comes in and it's like, he's got a three piece white suit on or, or off white. He's got a handkerchief in his pocket. He's got a pork pie hat on. <laughs> he's, he's like, looking at Richie going, I can't stand it when it's too loud. I want it softer, softer. And then Richie's like, oh, okay, but Dixon. You know, I never heard Richie Hayward play that soft in my life. But yeah, she, she, yeah the, it, it was just perfect. And, and so the rehearsal alone was worth every bit of it. It was priceless, in other words. <laughs> and uh, a couple nights later, we played for about 18,000 people. And uh, it was really cool. Wow. Uh, so all that's connected to Hal and Wolf. And then later to have these, the, not only the people that played with Hal and Wolf, because I saw him play live at the, at the Fillmore in San Francisco. Uh, wow. And Hebrew was probably in the band, I would, I would have imagined. Um, it just, and then the, the guy that wrote all those songs, Backdoor Man, um, Spoonful, etc. cetera, um, that's, that's Willie Dixon. I mean, you don't get any, any better than that. Um, yeah. So there, there, there we are. And then finally, number five, this is just another tune. You know, I think what we love about music is, is where it puts us emotionally, right? Absolutely. If we're in a bad place. We can either augment that place by, by cementing the sorrow we feel or um, the angst that we're going through or whatever it is. But there's also that joyful side that, that lifts us up and, and Sometimes it lifts us up from the very sorrows we, we're trying to, to get away from. But sometimes we can just be in a good mood and we just want to elevate that good mood a little bit more, right? This song is from 1970, Signed, Sealed, Delivered by Stevie Wonder. And I'm not kidding you, man. Every time I put that tune on, play it, you know, I just feel like dancing. I mean, I, I don't dance, but... It just puts me right there. When when President ex President Obama had that as his theme song, I went, man, this guy's he's okay. <laughs> yeah, I thought he was okay before, but I mean, I really just that's exactly it. As opposed to this fucking excuse me, this idiot that uh, is the ex ex now, the old Trumpster. <laughs> I'm good lord. Uh, yeah, we're in a mess over here in the United States. We've got a, some really good things going on, too. And that's the importance of being an artist as well. When you, when you sit down and say, well, what is it I have to say? What am I drawing on to say it? In other words, what are my influences? How do I line them up uh, to speak to people? Um, people have to make their own choices, but you can help guide. And I think yeah. that's, 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 that's what we do as artists. I mean, you're, you're an artist in your own right, and that's what you, you do. You do it through your interviews. I, I don't know if you're a musician or not. I am, but, I mean, you know, it's a long old slog these days to be trying to make old star music. I mean, I'm supporting the stylistics, but this podcast is bigger than, um, than you know, my own music. And I only started it when I was, like, 28, yeah. 29. So I've only been doing it for a couple of years, but... The stylistics invited me to open for them later this year, so that will be fun in any case. But you know, I'm more, I'm more a fan, you know, than a, an artist in my own right. That's for sure. I certainly can't play piano oh, like yeah. you. I think uh, it's all good because we need we need both ends of the spectrum. You know, I mean, I grew up playing piano just for myself, <clears throat> but I was also, I was cognizant that the neighbors were probably listening, whether they were or not. So I was not only playing for me, but I was playing for my neighbors. I was playing for my mom and dad and my mother and my brother and sister, let's say. So we always have an audience. And, yeah, uh, for sure. And it's, a, 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 it's, it's when you ask people this question, what are your five favorite albums or songs? 
you're essentially saying, what are you a fan of? Yeah. You know, and it's a common denominator because everybody's got five. Well, I mean, you occasionally get people because we occasionally have people who aren't musicians on the podcast. And so occasionally you get people you think who the team, you know, think, oh, might be interesting to come on. Right. And they're like, you know, very occasionally they're like, oh, I don't listen to any music. And you sort of think, oh, my God. <laughs> what planet are you living on? But uh, that's that's so rare. It's such yeah. a common. <laughs> well, it's it's true, man. It happens. My my dad could not carry a tune, and he he apologized to me late in life. He says, "I really didn't know what you were doing," and I said, "Well, I didn't honestly know what you were doing either as a mechanical and, and uh, engineer. I mean, but." I've studied more about what he was up to and, and it was an incredible field that he was involved in. Um, yeah. But that's that's the deal. We we all have our place in this life and how we utilize it is, is up to a lot of things. I, I've just been very, very fortunate to do what I do and and the fact that I can still do it and, and, and love doing it is uh, kind of beyond the pale sometimes. <laughs> just like, okay, don't anybody wake me up, you know? Well, you've you've more than earned it, and you know, th um, thank you so much for all the fantastic music, all the years of joy and entertainment that you've brought me and so many other people, Bill. And you know, you really are, um, in in my opinion, and in many other people's opinion, one of one of the greats. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate you joining me on the Greatest Music of All Time podcast and for choosing those uh, those tunes, um, which I'm looking forward to revisiting. And uh, yeah, re really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. It was, it was, it was really good to, uh, having a conversation with you, Tom. Do you sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night? I used to find it so difficult. I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a Lumi body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi Body Clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi Body Clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalize your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh. So if you're finding this a challenge and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com. If you're enjoying the greatest music of all time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.